morning and welcome to the Masterclass sessions. Today we welcome Rotarian Wendy Ford from Brookman's Park Rotary in Hertfordshire. Wendy is a public image team leader in District 1260 and has delivered a number of advanced Zoom training sessions. Now before we start the session, we would like to have a minute of reflection to remember the Duke of Edinburgh, whose funeral takes place later today. Thank you. Today's session will finish at midday. There will be three opportunities for questions during the session. Please submit any questions you may have during the session using the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. I would now like to hand over to Wendy to start today's session. Right, as we said, today's session is about uh, using Zoom and the, some of the advanced functions uh, that are available to us. Uh, now, uh, as Irene said, we will be pausing for questions a couple of times throughout. Uh, you'll see the Q&A button on the toolbar at the bottom. If you click that, that'll bring up a box and you can ask your question through there. When I was first asked to do this presentation for my own district, I asked the question about what the sort of things people wanted to know. Uh, and these are the topics that have come up with. So this is what we will be going through during the course of this morning's session. We've all learned how to use Zoom over the last year, but we've not necessarily kept up to date with it or found out if there are perhaps better ways of th doing things. Now, one point that I need to make is how do you access the functions? A lot of times people say to me, well, why can't I do such and such? The button's not there. You need to know that some of these functions need to be turned on via your account page. So you need to go into Zoom via the web page uh, and you can turn functions on from there. You also need to be either a host or a co-host to access some functions. A lot of things are, are, are specific for the host or the co-host. And some functions are only going to be available depending on which version of Zoom that you are running. So if you're running an older version of the Zoom app, then you're not going to be able to access the functions. And some functions are only available if you're using a paid account. And as we found out recently the other day, sometimes some functions are only available if you're logged into your Zoom account. So if you can't see anything, make sure you are logged into your Zoom account. And lastly, the, the screenshots are all correct at the time of recording, but Zoom is continually being updated and you can always check the release notes on their Zoom web page. You'll see some blue links throughout the presentation and you will be getting a copy of the slides afterwards. And if you click on the links, that will take you to the various Zoom help pages to provide more information. All the screenshots have been taken on a PC, so you may find that your layout may vary depending on what device you are using. So as mentioned, to access your account settings, you have to go into Zoom via what they call the web portal. So you go in via the Zoom website, um, which is zoom.us and log in. And from there, you can set up your own personal profile which means you can add a photograph if you wish for when your camera is off, but also quite importantly, if you're setting your uh, meetings and scheduling your meetings, is you want to set your date and time to the UK norms. Um, there are options here where you can uh, go for the change your settings. 
And there's two sections there. So there's a normal sort of settings section, which is easily visible. Uh, but also if you go into the account management section, you will find there's a second lot of settings. So there are some additional settings that are only available in that section. So what version of Zoom are you using? If you're not logged into the app, it's quite easy to tell because when you open the uh, bring the app up, you can see it says the uh, version number there at the bottom. And I think the current version is something like version 5.6.1. And it's useful to know, as, as I've said, which version of Zoom you're using um, because of the additional functions, but also because the older uh, versions of Zoom are just not so secure. A lot of Rotarians have been using Zoom for a year, but have never updated it unless Zoom forces the update. And really, Zoom updates pretty much every fortnight. Um, but they don't force those updates on you. So if you want to make sure that you've always got the most recent version, then you do need to go and uh, go to the Zoom site uh, and update your, your uh, device. Uh, going back to which version you are, if you are already logged in to the Zoom app, you will see the settings clog, cog. And if you click on the settings cog, it brings up a settings page and if you go into statistics, it will show you which version you're in. Uh, and one thing you might want to do on occasion is actually check what meeting you're actually in. I have occasionally opened a meeting and thought, why is nobody joining me? And the reason for that is basically because I've opened the wrong meeting. Um, depending on which version you're on, you should have a small green shield or you might have an I information button. And if you click on that shield, it will bring up the information to show which meeting you're in. And here you can see is the meeting that I was in on that occasion. And you can also access the settings from there, uh, from there as well, from, so from within the meeting. And again, you have the cog there. I said, if you want to download the most recent version of Zoom, uh, that is the link, which I've also just put into the chat. If you were to opt to go and do that immediately, it takes a couple of seconds to download the app. Um, while it's doing the, app, uh, the update, you will exit the meeting uh, and then you should be able to just come straight back in. As a host, one of your key tools is using your participants panel. And you use the participants panel to manage your attendees. But where it is depends slightly on how you have your screen set up. And if it, it's either floating, if you have a, a full screen zoom, or if you have your screen maximized, which is my personal preference, then you have your participants panel docked on the right hand side. Now it lists everybody in alphabetical first name order, and it will always put the hosts at the top. It will always have the unmuted above the muted. And then if somebody is to raise a hand, they will come to the top of the list. But you can also from there, mute everyone, mute people individually, ask someone to unmute or to show their camera, and there are options to rename people as well. And when you're muting, you do have the option to allow participants to uh, uh, unmute themselves at any time. Or if you have a larger meeting, you actually might want to leave it uh, that only you can unmute somebody. A um, couple of things that are, are quite found to be quite useful. Um, if Generally, the uh, Zoom toolbar uh, is one of these disappearing toolbars. Um, personally, I find that quite irritating. Um, so there is a setting, whereas if you want that toolbar to show permanently, you can turn it on. And again, that's you going into your app settings uh, when you're in Zoom uh, and go to general, and then you tick always show the controls. Um, if you are on an older version, that option will be uh, in the accessibility panel. As mentioned, you can change a person's name 
this is really useful if you haven't used registration or anything. You've got somebody coming in as so-and-so's iPad or uh, just a Samsung Galaxy or something of that nature. Uh, if you click on, um, sorry, hover over the person's name on the participants panel, you'll get an option for more. Again, if you hover over their camera, you get the three blue dots, or if, certainly if you're on a PC, you can right click the person's camera and that will bring up a shortcut menu. And from there, you can rename the person if you need to. But there are also a number of other options on that shortcut menu that I'll touch on as we're going through. And you should note that uh, if you do do a right click or, or a more or whatever, the options that are available to you are different if you are a host or just an attendee. So an attendee will have far less options there. Um, Nonverbal feedback and raised hands. These are functions that you do have to have on to be able to use. So again, it's uh, in the Zoom account settings, in the basic settings, you turn that on. And from version 5.4.7, the raised hand and the other reactions, which previously were at the bottom of the participants panel, are now actually on the, the main toolbar. And this really is an absolute godsend if you're running a meeting with more than 25 or 30 or 50 or however many people, because you just physically cannot see everybody's camera at once. So you need to, to get them used to using that raised hand function. But unlike the other reactions, like the smiley face and the thumbs up, they, they will disappear after five seconds. But in actual fact, the raised hand, that has to be lowered. And it has to be lowered either by you as the host or by the attendee themselves. Um, as mentioned, uh, as you can see here on this screenshot, um, you can see that I've got a couple of people that have got raised hands. So the attendees with the raised hands have gone to the top of the participants panel, but also the camera moves to the top left screen. So you will see all the cameras just shuffling around as somebody raises the hand. If multiple hands are raised, the top person listed in the participants panel is the first person that has raised their hand. The camera order is not necessarily in that same order as it does depend who has clicked their put their hand up at what time and uh, how the cameras have shuffled. And you'll also see at the bottom that you've got a, a note showing you how many cameras have actually, um, sorry, how many cameras are actually um, uh, hands are raised or reactions are being raised. Another fairly new function is the, uh, the fact that you can actually reorder your gallery. So this could be quite useful for uh, your, your meeting. You might want to put your president or your secretary on the top row of your gallery. And basically, if you put your cursor over a camera, it will change to a hand, and then you can just move the ca camera into the right position. That's also quite useful for a larger meeting when you might want to make sure that your speaker perhaps is in your camera view. So for most people, they can only show 25 cameras at a time in a gallery. It is possible to show up to 49 cameras at a time, and that does depend on the spec of your machine. Uh, and it's probably grayed out if it's not actually an option for your machine. Um, and also uh, for tablets and phone, it's even worse because they generally can only see one or two at a time and they have to actually sort of swipe uh, to see most people. Uh, as a host, you could also set it that other people view the cameras in the same order that you have got them. So again, that might be something that you might find useful. And you cannot reorder the gallery if you already have somebody who is spotlight or pinned. And we'll come on to that in a second. Uh, so as I said, the, the ability to view more cameras is dependent upon your machine. Uh, and if you do have the right uh, spec for your machine, uh, when you're in meeting, and if you go to your video settings, 
there is an option there to click on the 49 participants. So the pinning is the ability to pin a camera into position. So again, if we go to the example of a club meeting, the host could pin up to nine speakers. So they could put the president and secretary uh, up on the, in the top corner and pin them in position. And they will have a little symbol, a little pin symbol by their name that shows that they've been pinned. Now the host can actually pin up to nine speakers, but an attendee can actually uh, do just one, but that still can be quite useful. Um, and again, you click on the, uh, the person's name to, to unpin. But the other point to bear in mind is that you need to have at least three cameras for the spotlighting and the pinning to work. So if you're thinking, why isn't this working? You you're, and you're just doing a test run yourself, it's because you probably don't have enough cameras. Now spotlight is a really useful function if you have a speaker. So you spot, when you spotlight somebody, that, that overrides the active speaker. So if you have somebody coming in late and they have their mic on, their camera will not flash up in front of the speaker. It will stay on the person that is spotlighted. And that's really quite important, uh, not just for the people that are, are watching it, but also if you're using the recording, um, people are watching it later because it's really annoying uh, if you're watching it later and you just see random people popping up in place of your speaker. And again, you hover over the person's camera or use the uh, options on the participants panel and you have a spotlight uh, uh, option. Uh, and again, you'll get a little symbol will appear next to their camera that shows that they've been spotlighted. Uh, and for the host, you can actually spotlight up to nine participants uh, for a session. So that can be very useful if you've got uh, multiple speakers or a panel of speakers. Um, and as before, if you just click on the person, you can remove the spotlight. Now, virtual backgrounds, uh, most of us probably know how to do this, but there, there are other options that you need to be available. Um, you can have a virtual static background. And again, depending on the spec of your machine, you can actually have a video background, which can be quite fun. Um, Zoom comes with a number of standard backgrounds, uh, but you can add your own as, as well quite easily. Um, if you do not have uh, the spec for the machine, uh, you may actually need a proper green screen, um, but I think they're fairly cheaply available these days. If when you first started using Zoom, you found you couldn't do a virtual background. It is worth checking because they have done a number of updates recently, which have allowed for various uh, lower spec machines now to have a virtual background. And if you're looking for a rotary background, if you log into uh, Rotary GBNI you'll, and go into the public image section, you'll see that there are a number of ready-made backgrounds available that you can use. And you can also go to Brand Center on Rotary International. Um, and if you're adding your own background, you simply click on the plus button, uh, go to add image, and then you uh, browse to find the image uh, and you can change it. But there are also some other quite useful options that are now available. Uh, oops. Sorry. Um, on the virtual background, one of the newer ones, uh, which can be quite useful, is the blur background. So if you don't want people to see what you have in the background, then the blur might be quite a nice one to be using instead. And come Christmas time, or if you have an event, you might want to use the video fi filters to make your, interest your meeting a bit more interesting or a little bit more fun. And there are also various studio effects that you can have, which might be quite a nice thing to use, say for a polio day. So you can give yourself a different colored uh, eyebrows, uh, you can give yourself a little mustache, uh, and you can give yourself your, some colored lips as well. Um, so although those sort of things are all available just to sort of make 
things a little bit more fun. And, and if you want to sort of jazz up your meeting, wait to see how long somebody actually notices before they see something. Um, and the other thing, um, most of you have seen the infamous clip of the lawyer as a cat. And if you're wondering how that was done, uh, that's using a third party filter, a special effect filter such as Snap Camera. And that acts as another camera and you would just switch over to that. As I said, you can easily make your own. Uh, generally, they need to be uh, 19, 20 times 1080 uh, pixels in size. Uh, and once you've made those uh, as a PNG or a JPEG, you can add those images. Um, uh, another option that's coming quite recently is uh, background noise suppression. You ever had a person that has uh, particularly, this is particularly relevant if somebody is using a tablet because you get an awful lot of background noise with, with tablets. Uh, or you might get somebody who has a really creaky chair, that, uh, which after a while is quite annoying. So whilst this cannot be enforced by you, the host, this might be something you might want to point at, a, uh, at somebody and suggest that they look at this and they can actually increase the noise suppression. And apparently if it's on high, it should actually stop you know, the noise of the phone or the dogs barking and all of those sort of background noise that we just, um, you know, all find a little bit irritating, really. Uh, there we go. Right, setting up meetings. Most of us probably know how to do this, but we probably all do it in a set way. Um, there are two basic ways you can set up a meeting, and one of them is via the Zoom web portal, and one of them is via the Zoom app. I would always set up a meeting via the web portal because it does give me more options available. And I would recommend that you set up uh, meetings properly and try not to use your personal meeting ID for any larger meetings. If you use your personal meeting ID, it doesn't come with a passcode. So if you schedule a meeting, those scheduled meetings will always come up with a, a meeting ID and with a meeting passcode. So that keeps your meeting more secure. I would never publish a direct link to your meeting to social media or a web page. If you're going to publish a link uh, to those sort of areas, I would recommend you use the registration. I, personal preference here, I would never allow anyone to join the meeting before the host. Uh, I like to get myself set up and get things ready beforehand. Uh, and now always use a waiting room. And again, since September, this is now the default uh, option is on. And that's, again, is a security measure. With regards to the, the waiting room, there are a couple of things you can do with the waiting room. Uh, through your settings, uh, you can add both an image and a short message. So your short message could be saying, this meeting is due to start at X and X time. Uh, please be patient and we'll be with you shortly. And you can add, add an image, which in this case is not, I would normally have uh, my district logo as the image. They're not very big, but they all sort of just add just a little bit more professionalism to it. Um, as people come into the meeting uh, with the waiting room, you could admit them, which is what we most of us do, but there is an option even at this point to remove somebody. So if you're not sure about the person, uh, and I've had this, somebody come in on their uh, with their business name and not knowing who they are, um, I've not admitted that person. <coughs> you can also use the chat function to send a message to those in the, the waiting room. So that's useful if you think you're running a little bit late, but that will only work if you actually have anybody in the waiting room. So the option won't be there if there's no one in the waiting room. easiest option for most people when it comes to join a meeting is to click on the link. But you can also join most meetings by using the Zoom app and click on the join button. And then you'll be asked to type in the meeting ID. And in some cases, if it has it, the meeting passcode. And if you're not logged in, the, your email address as well. But there's also an option. If you click on the drop down arrow, 
uh, next to the where it says the meeting arrow, the, the meeting information, it will show you the list of the most recent meetings that you've been to. So for instance, your club meetings, which might be a regular meet, weekly meeting, if you're using a recurring meeting ID, that'll be on the list and you can quickly access that. So I've mentioned meeting registration. Um, meeting registration adds an extra level of control for you. But this has to be set up via the web portal. You cannot do this via the app. Um, and basically, when you're setting up your meeting, you just tick the option that says registration required. And then once you've done that and you've saved the meeting, you will find that you now have some additional options. So if you scroll to the bottom of your meeting page, you will see you've got a number of options. Um, and with regards to the registration, uh, you can edit those and you can add uh, additional questions. You can also add custom questions. <clears throat> so things like um, for your district meetings, you might wanna have a drop down list of all your clubs, or you might wanna ask whether they want to receive further information. So they're quite useful custom questions to have set up. You can also tick the box as to whether you as the host want to receive an email when somebody has registered. Um, that's something I tend to do with the smaller meetings, but not with the bigger meetings, just because you get inundated with them. <coughs> Once you have your meeting uh, set up, uh, you will find that you have a link to your uh, registration page. So rather than the direct link to the meeting, the link you get is the registration link. And that will show the topic and the meeting description and the time will show by default. And then the branding and the custom questions will show depending on which options you have uh, pre-selected. Um, you can also create a template. So again, for my district meetings, I have a template. So I don't have to type in 59 clubs name each time for my custom question. But the thing with using registrations you do need to remember is that you then need to send out the registration link. So whether you're sending that by a, a poster or whether you're using say MailChimp to send out a mailing to your district. So it's something that you need to do. And if you do use something like MailChimp, then obviously you can make that quite a good looking invitation, uh, which will attract more people. You can view the list of those who have registered at any time. Uh, the only downside of that, it will not show your custom question information. You can resend a confirmation email at any time. Uh, and you can cancel a registration for a person at any time. So if somebody, if somebody is registered who you are not sure about, you could actually go in and cancel their registration. The one thing you cannot do is edit a person's registration. And then you can download a report of the registrations at any time by going to the Zoom web portal and going to the report section, which is in account management. And that's a really useful thing to do, to do before a meeting that if you're running, you can download your registration report. You can then uh, produce a, a printed list that you can then refer to during the meeting, which for instance, will have a list of the names and the clubs of the people attending so you, know, you can immediately refer to it. Um, regardless of whether you've uh, set registration or not, uh, you can also have a recurring meeting. Um, and there are a number of options that are available with the recurring meeting. So you can make, say, option one would be to make it a weekly meeting. So that's really good for something like your club meetings. Um, option th three, which is, you can actually have it the attendees register once uh, and then can, sorry, can choose which session they wish to attend. So that might be something useful for something like assembly, which we have in our district coming up next week. Uh, we have seven sessions, they register once and they can pick which of the seven sessions that they wish to attend. You can also make your recurring meeting a non-specific time. So that it, one that you can just pull up anytime you want to use it. So I tend to use one of those for a training session. So you can brand your registration as, as mentioned. 
uh, and you can add the branding to your own page. So if you go to the bottom of your meeting details, there's a section marked branding, and you have an option there for to actually to put in two different uh, images. So I tend to use one uh, across the top of the page, uh, and the standard dimensions for that banner is 640 by 200. I actually wouldn't bother making it any bigger than that because it tends to be too big. And that image, these images will show both on your registration page and on the emails that you send out. You have a second option of set, setting a smaller square image, uh, and that's a 200 by 200 pixel size. And so you could put in an image, say, of the theme of the meeting, like today's masterclass, or if you have a speaker, you could actually include the image of the speaker. If you're using uh, webinars, there are additional options available depending on your level account, but I'm not going to go into that because I don't think any of us have got those sort of accounts. <clears throat> how to send a meeting link. You probably think you all know how to do this, uh, and you probably do, but it, uh, in conversation with a Rotarian in my district, he was having problems sending the links out because he was sending them always through Outlook and not everyone know systems would accept that. And that was basically the only way that he knew to do that. So for your meeting, if you go into uh, either the Zoom web portal or via the app, there is an option to copy the meeting information. And once you've copied that information, then obviously you can place that wherever you like uh, in your emails and so on and so forth. And as mentioned, you can send out via a, a calendar link but just bear in mind that not everybody uses the same calendar as you. They might not even use the calendar function at all. So I would generally send it out in the body of an email. And for meetings, as mentioned with registration, you do need to create your own uh, invitation and include the registration link for that. So if you're planning your meeting, again, this should be a few basic sort of things. Um, is get your slides ready in advance, obviously. Um, include a few basic instructions to your attendees. So where is the help? Where is the chat? Where is the Q&A as we did earlier? Um, and possibly so images of your presenters as well. I would recommend having at least one other knowledgeable co-host. So somebody that can assist you, whether that's just to help admit people while you're busy uh, or uh, check on the raise hands and so on and so forth. And do think about having a dry run or a practice session. Uh, that can really sort of help, um, particularly if you're dealing with uh, a number of speakers, um, that might be something that you actually want to try out. Uh, and I'm just put, putting in the chat a sample running order. Uh, this is one that I've just put together myself um, and it just gives you an idea of the things that I look at when I'm planning a meeting. Always test the different functions on your setup before you start. So we're going to be talking about sharing screening and uh, showing videos and so on and so forth. Um, check that they all work OK. And check that your camera and audio and that of your presenters are also working OK. We've all had occasions when our presenters have turned up uh, and you can barely see them or you can't hear them. They've got Internet connections. Give yourself a good 10 to 15 minutes to set up before you open the meeting to everyone else. Get yourself comfortable. Make sure you have everything to hand. It sounds basic, but make sure you've got a drink, you've got a pen, you've got a notepad, you've got everything that you need within distance. And when you're setting up, these are a few things to sort of think about. Now think about your lighting. And that's actually particularly relevant now as evenings are getting lighter and you can start the meeting when it's quite bright outside. But by the end of the meeting, it's gone quite dark. And if you haven't thought about your lighting ahead of time, you could be just a bit of a black blob to everyone. And make sure that you've got the camera angle set up. We've had one of our uh, regular presenters. He has it set up so he's always looking to one side. That is not a good view. Or we have another one of our club members who's always at the bottom of the camera, and that is not a good view. And also, you really don't want to get too close to the camera because basically that's just not flattering for any of us. 
Uh, there's a link here to a little video that will be on the slides, and it just talks about things about getting your getting yourself set up, getting your camera set up, uh, and just giving some thought to those sort of things. And if you are using a mobile phone to connect and you are on camera, do turn it 90 degrees so that you're in a landscape view. A, a portrait view on a, uh, for everyone else is really small and, and it just doesn't work very well. And yes, sometimes that means you get to see the ceiling or whatever as they do so, um, but it is in the long run just much, much better. So uh, we've probably all used chat uh, on various occasions. And again, this is something that is set up from within your uh, basic settings on the Zoom web portal. Uh, so you can set up whether you have the chat on, whether private chat, whether you can save chat or whether you allow other people to save chat. But you can also set it up to limit the types of files that you might want people to upload. So you might want to make sure that it's safe and perhaps just allow PDFs uh, or maybe basic JPEGs or, or something of that nature. Uh, and you can also add a limit as to the file size. So bear in mind that we're all using this via our internet, trying to send massive files via your chat is probably not gonna help uh, anybody at all. You access the chat from your main toolbar, um, but if you're screen sharing, you get a different toolbar. So it's important to know that that chat is then available off the more button uh, where you have additional options. Um, for any meeting, the host can determine who can chat. So you can actually limit that to no one, just the host or the participants. Um, and it, again, you can allow whether the chat can be saved. And if you do save the chat, it saves it into the default uh, folder location. And certainly for a PC, that is in your documents folder, you will have a Zoom folder, and then it will create a folder with the meeting date and time. And it's something you may not even realize is, is there unless you have a cause to go and look for your, your chat. As mentioned, as you've seen, you can use the chat to transfer files. So that's, a, a, you, you click where it says file, and that will give you a number of options to uh, select whether you're coming from your your OneDrive or your Google Cloud, or probably more likely your computer. Uh, you click on that, use the browse to select the file that you want. As the host, you will get a little message to say that the file has been uploaded successfully. And then the attendees will see that in the chat. point to make uh, if you're using uh, breakout rooms, which we'll be talking about later, so that any chat that is uh, conducted before the rooms are started is going to be viewable by all. But any chat that is within the breakout room is only viewable by those participants in the room. When you exit the breakout room, that chat is not then in the main feed. So it does not get saved within the main feed either. So if you want to keep your breakout room chat, you must save that before exiting. And setting a co-host, uh, as mentioned, having a co-host to help you run particularly larger meetings is really a very good idea. But this is something that you must have the option on before you start the meeting. So you have to go into the Zoom web, web portal select the option that would allow you to make somebody a co-host. Once you're in the meeting, again, if you go to the participants panel or the person's camera and use the uh, shortcut menu, you have an option to make that person a co-host. And the co-host will then generally have the same abilities as a host uh, and should, should therefore be able to do the same things. So how do you record your meeting? Well, most of us probably know this, uh, you record it, you can set this up uh, to record either to your hard drive or to your Zoom cloud. I would recommend to your Zoom cloud. Um, and you can also prevent other people from recording it uh, by, taking the by making sure that the option for local recordings is off. And that might be something that you might want to make sure that you have off if a speaker has particularly said they don't want you sharing their recording. When you set up your meeting, you have an option to automatically record the meeting. 
personal preference, I have it on. I would rather record every meeting and not use it uh, than have the other way around, which has on occasion happened. And from the toolbar, you can, of course, pause, start or stop your recording. But as said, uh, as we'll mention again later, the recording is only of your main Zoom room. It will not include any breakout rooms. Again, within the cloud recording, you have different settings and you can set what is recalled. My personal preference is to record the active speaker with the shared screen, but you could set that for the gallery view with the shared screen. But think about what you're going to be doing with that recording later. Is that recording going to be made available for others to view? In which case, I would strongly recommend that you use the active speaker with the shared screen option. If they're watching something afterwards and you have somebody speaking and they're only one of 25 cameras, they cannot see that person very clearly. Uh, and the whole thing then loses the impact. Um, now you're probably aware of this, but uh, basic Zoom accounts come with only one gigabytes worth of storage space. So you do need to regularly download your recordings or delete recordings. Um, but if you do be get, get over quota, um, they will send you an email. So they're not just going to automatically charge you. Um, they will send you an email and you will have time to go in and, and sort it. And when you delete a recording, it is still available in your trash for another 30 days. Uh, and this is something I found yesterday in the report section. You can actually see this uh, uh, a small bar, uh, line graph that shows you uh, how much I had stored on my cloud with Zoom, um, which at 12 gigabytes at the peak was way too much for my account. Um, but as you see, I've, I've able to, to bring that down and I've deleted an awful lot of thing. So that can be quite useful if you're not sure how much space you're taking up, uh, go to the reports, go to the cloud recording and it will show you what you have recorded on there. Right, so we'll now take a pause uh, and I can see we've got some questions uh, come through and I will just give my voice a rest for a second. Right, and I'll, I'll give you your voice a rest. I'll just, um, so the presentation uh, will be available after the event. We'll pop that at the very, very end of our session. We will put in a PDF version of Wendy's slides. We'll look at that as much as you like. And for those who weren't able to join us, that will be available also because there's a lot of information there. Now, Eve Conway asks, when I raise my hand, does it, does it, it does disappear after a few seconds, but Wendy said that the, the remained hand, uh, the, the raised hand remains there. What's going on there, um, Wendy, do you think? Uh, I think it's very likely she's using a very old version and needs to update her Zoom. Um, and, and you can sort of see if you've got an older version uh, and you raise your hand, um, if it comes out either blue or a faint gold, that tends to mean that you've got a, an older version uh, of Zoom. Uh, and if it comes up as a gold hand, then that tends to mean that you've got a, a, a more normal one. And also some people mistake the raise hand for the thumbs up uh, or the waving um as well and if you thumbs up or wave they will disappear after five seconds um, so i normally keep an eye on my participants panel uh, because there will be one or two people that think they're raising their hand and, and actually they're waving or something uh, and if i see somebody that's um uh, done that i will sort of make the point and ask them as the host uh, did they have a question they wanted to raise Oh, that's great. Thanks very much for that. So the message there is, and you, you did say that, get the updated version of Zoom. That's going to help you enormously. Now, Sue Lipman asks, if someone is in the waiting room and I don't recognise them there, is there any way to speak to them? Um, no, at the moment, you can't speak to that person um, directly. Um, longer term, Zoom is bringing in the ability that you'll be able to see that person's camera when they're in the waiting room. But... Um, I don't have an ETAs when that's likely to happen. But what you could do is send a message to uh, the waiting room, um, which uh, asking that person perhaps to sort of say something or make them aware. And it does happen that people will come in, perhaps uh, uh, they've been on a quiz and they've left their name as uh, 
gentle giant Joe or something, um, which happens regularly on my uh, Pilates session. And if you, yeah, if you don't recognize the name, um, you can either remove that person or send them a message um, or just ignore them and wait. Um, and if quite often, if you just don't admit them, people will come off, realize there's an issue and come back in uh, properly. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Gillian Campbell from Hearing Ambassadors raised the issue of uh, subtitles. Now, I put a comment into the chat to say enable live transcript. Now, we had enabled it uh, before, so perhaps we should have mentioned that earlier. Do you have you any other comment about that, Wendy? Uh, I've got a couple of slides coming up towards the uh, end of the session uh, that talks about how to enable closed captions. At the moment, you have to use a third party service, um, but the Zoom are looking to integrate that. But that service is not likely to be integrated until um, autumn. Right. Thanks very much for that. So Willem Peterson says, uh, when showing a screen, i.e. showing a video, when I work with, say, breakout rooms while attendees watch, a black block appears on the viewer screen, blocking out some of the video. How can I remove this? Uh, it's probably down to how you're showing the, the video mm -hmm. uh, and it's also that there is an option to show your zoom toolbars um, while you're in a meeting um, which I have explored because obviously it would make these sort of uh, instructions a lot easier mm -hmm. but I did find that when I had that option on it did mean that as I'm moving my my uh, say my chat around, it could then block out the other video. So there, there could be a couple of different things going on there. Um, so I would check to make sure you don't, that, that the option to show your Zoom toolbar is, is off. Uh, and then we'll be talking about sharing screening and videos shortly. Um, and there, there is a, a newer method that uh, does improve things for everyone. Oh, that's great, thanks. Now, Philip Begg says, if the speaker is using share to display PowerPoint, for example, and I spotlight the speaker, what do the recipients see on the screen? Uh, the recipients will see uh, the PowerPoint and the speaker. Right. So um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that there are some uh, uh, there are some screenshots coming up as we're going to be talking about screen sharing uh, in the next section, which hopefully will show that. Yeah. yeah. And Robert Bracegirdle has a question. If I download updates onto my Mac, will they do so on my iPad and iPhone as well? Uh, as and he says, I often have more than one Zoom meeting going on at the same time. <laughs> no, you, you would have to do the uh, update for each individual device. Yeah. So, and John Shipman says, um, and this is probably down to how he's set it up, I think. Currently, I only have chat raise hand, Q&A and live transcript on the bottom bar on my desktop screen? Uh, well, again, it depends on whether you're a host or attendee. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're an attendee, you will have less options than the host. Yeah. Uh, so that would probably, that sounds fairly normal. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're a host, you'll have additional options. But as we've said, you need to have those additional options turned in on, on the Zoom web portal in your account settings. So if you're hosting and you haven't got a breakout room uh, button, it's because you haven't got breakout rooms uh, set uh, yeah. to sh it within your account. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Now, John Shipman asks, where is the participants prompt? Not quite sure about that question. Uh, does he mean the participants panel? Possibly, uh, yes. It's a, I bet you that is what it is. Is that yeah, if, the panel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, all of us should have a button that says uh, participants. Uh, now, because we're in a webinar, it won't uh, do anything today for the attendees. But if you're in Zoom meetings, if you click on the participants button on the toolbar, it will bring up the participants panel. Uh, and whether that's docked or a floating panel depends on whether you're full screen or maximized. Yeah, no, that's great. That's and I think, uh, most of the people attending this will be attending meetings. But we have chosen webinar, and, and I know that we are going to go into that later on. And Robert says, and it's just a comment, that, uh, that there was an assumption that we would know about MailChimp. And he says he wasn't sure what it was. But, you know, we, that's probably for another session, I think, MailChimp. If you want uh, to yeah, and Matt, just, just briefly, uh, MailChimp is a, a third party, um, well, it's, it's, it's a website 
um, but where you can upload your, um, uh, your database of people that you want to contact uh, and you can create emails uh, that you can then send to them so you can make them look very pretty. It also has the advantage um, that if you're doing it in MailChimp rather than within your Outlook, is that they're less likely to sort of uh, fall apart, shall we say, when the recipient receives them, because the MailChimp will be testing to make sure that the email is suitable for all sorts of different systems. Um, so you can get a basic free MailChimp account. Um, uh, takes a little bit while to sort of uh, get used to, um, uh, but it's quite a good way of creating your invitations for things like uh, larger meetings or, or uh, say district councils or district assemblies, you can create that sort of prettier email um, and send out to, to the people that you have on your database. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Now, Jim Curry has a couple of questions and I think they're practical questions. And he wants to know how you change the angle of the camera on a PC. And he wants to know how to make sure your presentation is there or where you need it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, yes, the, the, the basic way of changing the angle of the camera, if, if it's an integrated camera, it would be a case of you, you sometimes if you're on a laptop, you will need to prop your laptop uh, up. Um, I'll show you a picture that will be coming up that shows the little stand that I've got my laptop on. Uh, I, my laptop is, is angled um, and, so, and I've got it at the right height so that I'm actually looking straight into um, the camera. Um, if you're using a, a, a separate camera, um, uh, then obviously you could put that separate camera uh, on um, uh, on a tripod or something. Yeah. So if I just pick up, uh, you see, I've got a separate camera here uh, that I'm actually using. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see the rest of my living room, basically, if I chose. Yeah. No, that's super, thanks. Now, Gillian Cam uh, Campbell makes another comment. She just said that co-hosts can record individually the breakout rooms. So that was just a, you know, a point of um, a, a point there. So yeah. that's fine. But you have and to be well, in the room. You yes. do actually have to be in the room. That's right. So we'll just ask maybe about another three questions and then we'll go back to the main body. Your questions will be answered, but I think it's generating a lot of interest. So, <laughs> But I think some things will be answered naturally as we go through the, the session. So I'll do another three and then we'll, we'll start again. Is that okay, Wendy? Yep, yeah, fine. Yeah. Yep. So um, Sue, obviously Sue's paying attention here, Sue Lipman, when recording as host and speaker is screen sharing, if as host I open the participants list during the speaker screen share, will the participants list appear on the record? No. Okay. no the, the only thing that, that gets uh, recorded uh, mm -hmm. would be what you've got set up. So things like your participants and your chat, yeah. um, those don't appear on any recording. Yeah. Um, and again, if you've got it set up to record um, speaker view and um, screen share, then what they will see will be the, the presentation with the speaker's camera uh, uh, adjacent to that. Yeah, no, that's lovely. Now, the last three questions are all about um, tech software so, and, and transcript services. So Ravi Many asks, um, would you recommend any transcription service to take minutes of the meeting? Andrew Page asks if it's possible to save the full transcript. And Jeff Barnes asks what speech to text software is being used. So very similar there. Uh, I'm not sure uh, which software Phil has got this one set up with. Um, the, the, the one that um, uh, I was recommended to mm -hmm. is one uh, by a company called Otter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's otter.ai and when we get to the section about the uh, captions I will upload the help sheet that they have provided that will talk you through mm -hmm. uh, and yes it will provide all of those uh, it does do a live transcript and it will provide a full transcript uh, for you um, I'll probably say this again but obviously uh, you can train your voice uh, with the otter so uh, you can go into your otter account it'll ask you to read out a paragraph so it can better recognize your voice which is quite useful um, but you do have to be a little bit careful with people that have strong accents uh, and that some things can get um, misinterpreted uh, and occasionally and we've all seen this on sort of uh, BBC programs as, as well um, is that the subtitles are, can be a bit <laughs> 
a bit funny on occasion because they've been misinterpreted so yeah um no that's super thanks for that so i think we'll go back to the, the main, uh, you know, the main presentation, and then we'll go through the questions and we'll just, for the next break. So I will stop my video and let you carry on, Wendy, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, right, hopefully my voice will uh, hold out for the rest of the session, but do excuse me if I have to cough or keep sipping. Um, right, the next section is uh, screen sharing. Um, and you might think this is all fairly straightforward, but actually there are an awful lot of options available uh, when it comes to screen sharing. Uh, so within the Zoom uh, account settings, there are options as to who can share the screen, um, but this, you can also change that while you're in the meeting. Um, you can also, uh, one thing that people don't realize, there is an option where you can allow uh, somebody else's mouse to take control of the screen. Uh, so that might be quite useful if you as the host is sharing the slides uh, and somebody else is actually uh, wants to click through them. You just have to be a little bit careful with that because if the host then moves the mouse off of the presentation onto Zoom, it can take the focus away and they then need to sort of reactivate the focus to be able to carry on clicking through their presentation. So whilst you're in the meeting, you click on the share screen uh, button on your toolbar um, and you get a number of different options. Um, there is an option to share your full screen. I would recommend never doing that. Uh, you don't want people to see everything that you have up because quite often we all have our email up as well. So I would suggest that you share a specific program and generally that's going to be PowerPoint. Uh, and if you are sharing a PowerPoint, I would recommend having it already in slideshow mode before you start. Um, and that looks far more professional if you go straight into your uh, PowerPoint. And if you can see here, you've got two entries for PowerPoint because you can see the normal mode, but there is a second option that said slideshow. So that would be the one that you want to pick. Um, in the meeting, as I said, there are options that you can uh, select to, to choose who gets to see what, uh, sorry, who can share. Um, if you have a speaker and you have a larger meeting and you want them to share a, a screen, um, you can either select that everybody can share, but if again, if it's a larger meeting, you might not want to do that, in which case, if you make them co-host, that will give them the ability to share. Um, so you might want to use caution uh, uh, with a larger meeting to select that everyone can share. Uh, and for most occasions, you probably just want to leave the default as to one participant can share at a time. Um, from an attendee's point of view uh, or participants, um, uh, this is what they would normally see. So uh, this is what someone was just asking. You can see on the, the screenshot, uh, in the bottom corner, they will see the um, PowerPoint and they will see the person's camera. But they've also got options about uh, that they can change. And so if they click on the view or on the view options, you can actually move the camera because quite often they're across the top and they're not very big. Uh, and you can use move the camera to the side by side mode. And if you're in the side by side mode, and again, this is something most people don't realize, is that you've got those two little bars between the camera and the presentation. Uh, and if you mouse over those, then you can just move things uh, left to right. You can make your camera size bigger, your presentation size uh, smaller or vice versa. Um, if you're not in side by side mode, there's also an option to switch the shared screen and the camera. So that might be something that some people might find useful uh, if they want to focus more on the speaker than on the slides. And if you're already screen sharing, um, from your Zoom toolbar, to, to switch seamlessly to a second share, use the new share. So that means you go straight into the share. So there's no stopping where the participants then see so-and-so stopped, then uh, uh, wait while you're then bringing the second one up. You can go straight into a new share. So you can seamlessly slip from your presentation, say, to your video and then back to your presentation. And from that toolbar, uh, some of the options that are normally visible on the main toolbar, which disappear, 
If you click on the more, then you've got those options there. A lot of us are sharing videos um, and there are a lot of pitfalls about sharing videos. So since um, I think it's February, end of February, there is a new option now where you can share your video direct through Zoom. And this would be my recommendation to do it this way. It gives you by far the best performance. When you're sharing that video, uh, so you go to the advanced tab and click on uh, video, uh, you click on the share, you then browse to, to the video to select it. Um, and as you select that, the share sound and optimize the video are automatically se selected. And when it's, the video is optimized, it's gonna optimize the video so that as it's being sent to everybody's computer, it is gonna put it back together again, shall we say, for the best results for each individual person. Um, for the video to work, um, as often does with the, the, uh, the background, virtual backgrounds as well, you might be prompted to uh, download an add-on to make this work. Take, usually takes 30 seconds to do that, but it's definitely worth doing. Uh, there are some minimum specifications for this, so you do need a uh, decently a decent device for that, needs to have a uh, fairly good processor speed. Uh, you need to have a good um, a connection speed as well. If you have a poor connection, then that will probably be grayed out. Um, and as we found out the other day when we were testing this for something else, you actually also need to be logged into your Zoom account. Um, we found that if you weren't logged in, the Zoom option um, um, just wasn't there. So from the host point of view, the video will come up in a floating window and you will get the normal sort of play and pause and play button button at, uh, at the bottom and you have a button for volume as well so you can adjust the volume so again this is something that you want to check beforehand you want somebody else with you who can tell you whether the volume's at a good level level or a bottom uh, sorry a bad level uh, the one thing to be kept to be aware of is when you're sharing the video all other cameras will disappear and, and that is so that the system can be properly optimized to send that video out. And this is what the participant will see. So the video will be maximized and then the cameras will be uh, alongside it. If you don't have that option and you're thinking, well, I still want to show a video, uh, you can still do this via the basic share. Um, you would then have to have your video in your playback program, which whatever program it is that you you want so you want that sort of ready to go in the background um, you click on your basic share and you uh, select your video but then you need to then make sure that you've got the share computer sound and the optimized video checked they are not automatically checked so you have to do that and as we said that is to make sure that you get the best results um, and also the other thing i found is that you need to make sure that your audio output on the computer is the same as the audio output within Zoom. Uh, if they're not the same, then sometimes uh, the, the sound won't come through. And you also have to keep your mic open and this catches people unaware. They think they're doing the right thing uh, by turning off their mic. Uh, and I've done this myself in the early days. I've turned my mic off uh, and actually that will turn the sound off on the video as well. So that's why I recommend using the, the video uh, option that Zoom now provide, because you can mute yourself, play the video, uh, carry on and do things, uh, and it won't disrupt the video playing. If you have to use the basic share, you have to keep your mic open and you have to keep your mouse focus on the video, because if you take your mouse focus off the video, go and click on something else within Zoom, uh, that will likely stop the video. And these are all things that I found out the hard way. You can also just share your audio, um, uh, which again is within the advanced section. There is an option to show to share the uh, audio. Um, and you would play the audio however you like, which within whatever program you like, but that program's not going to show. So this might be quite a good one if you're doing a quiz and you've got a music round, 
you don't actually want to show the app that you're playing in because it will probably give away the name of the track. Uh, and this will literally just play the, um, the audio for you. And at the top of the screen, in, in that sort of green bar that normally says you're screen sharing, it will say so-and-so is sharing the, the computer sound. But again, if that option is not available to you, you can still, uh, as we've said, share the audio via uh, a basic share uh, by sharing your whatever your audio application is. Um, but you do have to have the share sound option ticked and you do obviously have to have your mic uh, open. And, and this does tend to lead to a lot of distortion to the sound. And if everyone else's mic's open as well, that can also be a problem. Um, so you might want to ensure that you've got everyone muted while you're playing the music clip unmute them while you're you know all working out what the clip was or whatever um, but then mute them again when you play the next clip most of us are sharing powerpoints um, so i would recommend making using your powerpoint slides at the 16 to 9 uh, proportion uh, and the reason for that is you get black bars otherwise um, the share screen area is a sort of set proportion of the screen uh, so you might as well use it all um, if it isn't uh, a 169 uh, slide, then your, your uh, PowerPoint will get centered into that sort of area. Um, but if you want more control over your PowerPoint, there is an option within PowerPoint when you do a slide show to show it within a, a window, which some people might find more, comf be more comfortable with um, and, and might be easier when you're doing a, a share. And a point to note that obviously when I click a slide, there can be a slight delay for when that slide shows to somebody else. So if, if you're clicking the slides for somebody and they're saying next slide, they need to be aware that there'll be a short delay uh, while you click the slide. And also because you might actually be doing something else before they've just said next slide. Um, generally, I'd say stick to basic animations. Um, again, it all comes down to sort of bandwidth. Uh, you can do all sort of very uh, advanced animations. Uh, but the likelihood is, is that that won't be very effective and it could appear quite sort of jerky um, to, the, to the user. Uh, and the other thing is um, when you're sharing your screen, be very careful about using your Zoom shortcuts uh, during this at the same time. Uh, things like I think most of us know that uh, clicking on the space bar will mute or unmute you. Um, but if you're actually your focus is on your PowerPoint, that will also move the slide on. Um, and that can be very disconcerting uh, if you don't know why that's doing it. And again, that one's one I found out the hard way. So when you are presenting uh, in PowerPoint, um, you, the host, probably want your PowerPoint to be in presenter view, but you actually want to be sharing the slideshow view. So you need to get this sort of set up so that you have both the presenter view and the slideshow uh, uh, showing. So you can see on this uh, graphic here, there are three entries now for, this, for PowerPoint, one of which is the slideshow, uh, one of which is the presenter view. But what you'll find is once you put slides, uh, sorry, PowerPoint into slideshow view, that fills the screen, it brings it to the front. So you might have to use something like Alt-Tab on a PC or Command-Tab to just scroll through your open windows and to get back to your Zoom or get back to your presenter view uh, on that. But what you might find as, a, as an easier option, and this is particularly if you're on uh, a sing, just using a single monitor, is just to share a portion of your screen. So again, this is a, a, on the advanced uh, options. Uh, there's an uh, option to select a portion of your screen. And if you click that, it will give you a green box. So if you've got your PowerPoint on a presenter view, you can then just size the green box to the slide area and it will just show that slide area. It's not going to show the next slide coming up and your notes or, or anything of that, um, that nature. So it just shows the bit that you want to show. And that's particularly useful, I find, that actually when you're just using uh, one monitor, which a lot of us will be doing. And while you're sharing, you might think, well, I can only see one person, I can only see uh, me. 
but actually there are different options that are available to you. So once you're screen sharing, your cameras go into a floating window. So the floating window that you can move around your screen so you can position it where you want. And the default option is that is just to show the single uh, active speaker. But there is also uh, another option where it will show a gallery uh, in a strip. So that's good if there's three or four of you. Uh, or you can show a grid. So that can be very useful if you're showing if you've got half a dozen and you actually want to be able to see the people that you're talking to while you're presenting. Another relatively new uh, option here is you can actually share multiple screens uh, at once. I haven't personally found a particular use for this, um, but it could be useful if you're actually sort of collaborating or need to show multiple things. Uh, and you will find it better if the windows are not maximized. So when you go to your basic share, you select your first item, and then it will give you a, a little prompt that says, if you hold down shift on a PC, uh, sorry, control on a PC, shift on a Mac, it will allow you to select an additional screen. And you can see that I've got two screens here selected. Uh, once I've gone to the share screen, there are now two, two of those green boxes around the each individual uh, item that I want to share. So from the attendees point of view, that's how that screen share would look like. So the two items that you're sharing are showing side by side. But you do need to make sure that your windows are properly positioned. So you don't necessarily want one on top of the other. Um, you know, you'll want to make sure that they're properly sort of uh, spaced out. Another one of the advanced options, and this could be useful if you want to make a particularly strong point and, and you probably don't want to overuse it, but there are occasions where you want it perhaps a little bit more of a, an intimate presentation is that you can actually share your PowerPoint as your background. Uh, and for this, you go into the advanced share PowerPoint as a virtual background. One thing point to note, you can't have the PowerPoint already open elsewhere. So if you've got it open in PowerPoint first, you do have to shut it down. And then once you've used the browsed and opened your PowerPoint, it will take a few moments to load. And you might want to think about where you're sitting uh, in relation to the sort of camera. Obviously, I'm presenting through a normal screen share. I've got myself centered onto the camera. But if you're actually doing PowerPoint as a, as a virtual background, you might want to be a little bit more to one side, perhaps. And you need to remember to leave a sort of a blank space for where you are going to appear on those slides so that your, your crucial information is not, is not being hidden by you. And when you do start that slide share, it will always start from the first slide. Um, and then you will find that you will have a basic backwards and forwards uh, buttons on the slides. So this is how it would look. Uh, so you can see that there are pictures of me and, and you probably noticed I've taken these screenshots at varying times that the hair has got a bit longer as we've gone through lockdown, uh, a couple more inches and it'll be long enough to sell off for uh, making wigs for charity. Um, that's by the by. But yeah, that, that's how it appears for everyone else. Uh, and for you, uh, it will also show you uh, as a small camera as well, but you are then superimposed uh, onto your PowerPoint. And some people, you probably don't also realize that if you have done this, you can actually make that camera bigger so you can make more of an impression on the screen. Uh, and so if you click on the camera, you will get a, a blue box and you can just use that blue box to adjust the, the proportion of the camera and how much space you want to fill. So as I say, this is where it's quite important if you're actually thinking of using this is to give it quite a bit of thought beforehand uh, with your slide set up to make sure that you're not covering important information. And once you've got the camera to the size that you want, just click out again uh, and you can actually see that the blue box will have gone and you'll be uh, ready to go away. Another advanced option here uh, is a second camera, content from a second camera. Uh, might be something that we might be wanting to think about uh, where, as we're going forwards if we're broadcasting, say, a meeting to other people. 
Um, but there is a, an, another Zoom session at the end of the month by one of the other districts about hybrid Zoom meetings that would probably help us more on this area. So it's just something if you've got two cameras. So here I've got uh, my main camera is the uh, camera I have connected by USB, but I've also got a camera on the laptop uh, and you have the option to share that camera and it will fill the screen um, and it will look like a normal screen share. So it will be quite big. Uh, uh, if you don't have an additional camera, then it will just show your normal camera. If you have more than one camera, you get this option in the top corner that allows you to switch screens, uh, sorry, switch cameras. And that will, each time you click that, that'll scroll through the number of available cameras to you. Um, I get asked a lot about uh, Zoom uh, doing using dual monitors. Uh, I can only really give a uh, basic advice on this because it is basically all down to what you have. Uh, and we've all got a different, different technical setup. Um, but this is a lot easier if you have more up to date kit. Uh, and if you have a smart TV, you can connect your, your laptop or whatever via an HDMI cable to your smart TV, uh, which is how I have it currently. And then when you go to the screen share, you see I have an option for screen two. And I'm just selecting that screen to share. You do need to make sure that your laptop is set up correctly so that it's sharing across the two devices correctly. And obviously you need to make sure that your input device is correctly set up as well. Um, and for those that were asking about uh, angles and stuff, uh, this just shows how I had it set up for one of our council meetings last November. As I say, you can see I've got my laptop uh, on a stand, so I've got it at, at a good angle, so the camera's straight for me. Uh, towards me, I've got my uh, laptop connected to the TV and I've got the TV showing the PowerPoint. Uh, on this occasion, I've also got um, a second laptop, which I'm logged in to as an attendee, uh, so that I can make sure that I can sit, you know, that what I believe I'm showing is actually what is being uh, seen by people. Uh, and this is actually what my, how my screen looks on this. So I've got my uh, PowerPoint in presenter mode, uh, but I haven't got it filling the screen. So I've got my presenter list to one side. Uh, I've got my cameras positioned and I've got my chat so that I can see everything that I need to see uh, during the duration of the presentation. If you're doing training sessions, uh, one thing you might want to think about using is the uh, whiteboard. Uh, again, you have to have uh, the whiteboard option set up in your basic settings within Zoom. And you will also want to make sure that you have your annotation tool set up. Uh, otherwise you can't annotate anything. Um, uh, and whether it allows for the sharing of the annotations as, as well. Um, so if you want a collaborative uh, uh, session, you want to make sure that everybody can actually access those annotation tools uh, and to be able to write uh, onto the whiteboard. Uh, so it's a basic uh, screen share and you just click whiteboard and effectively what you will see is a blank white screen. And then from your uh, sharing toolbar, you can then select your annotation tools. Uh, and so with the annotation tools, you can write, you can draw boxes, you can draw arrows, you can draw whatever you like uh, on there. Um, from an attendee's point of view, as I said, they will just see the blank screen. And from the view options, they will get the, the uh, oops, uh, from their options at the top of the screen, they will get the option there where they can click on the annotate tools and bring the annotate tools uh, uh, to, for their active use. So at the end of your session, you might want to sort of save that. Um, there is an option at the end of the annotation toolbar to save the image. Uh, and you can save that as either a PNG or, or a PDF. And again, uh, like the chat, that saves it to your default local recording uh, location, which is your documents folder slash Zoom slash the meeting uh, date and time. Um, and there is another sort of option that's quite useful where it says show in folder. So if you're then coming back to the main room and you think you might want to actually immediately share what you've, you've written on your whiteboard, 
is, is showing the folder and that just makes it easier for you to locate the image um, as and when you want to uh, make it available to share. And the annotation tools are not just for the whiteboards, they can actually be used at any sort of screen share. So you could share a slide that has some basic topics um, from a PowerPoint uh, and then use the annotation tools to make comments or add comments uh, uh, to that. Uh, and the spotlight use, uh, option on the to annotate is really, it's a very useful one if you want to be trying to point out things um, as you're going along. Another question I'm asked about is how do we poll? Uh, polling is, is really good. It's a really good way of actually obviously finding out things, but it's also a good way of um, breaking the, the, the meeting up a little bit to keep people uh, attentive. Um, and it is difficult when like today, it's one person sort of speaking at you. Um, uh, I, I'm sort of fully aware of that um, to keep your attention on it. So if you throw in a poll here or there, and it could be something quite frivolous um, uh, about what type of music you like, or it could be something more serious like in your district council, you might wanna use your polls for uh, voting for instance. Like many of the other things I've mentioned, it needs to be set up in your basic settings before you can uh, have the option to poll. And the best way to add a poll is you add the poll before you open the meeting. Whilst you can do it during the meeting, it effectively takes you back to this page. So it's better to get it set up and then you can check that everything is correct uh, beforehand. So on your meeting uh, details page, you scroll to the bottom of the meeting details uh, and you'll get an option here that says poll. Um, if you've got registration, it will say poll. If, if you don't have registration set, set up, it will just say you've not created any poll yet and, and it gives you an option to add. To set up the poll, uh, you click on that add and it will bring up a window. Uh, give it a name, the name is for your use, uh, so, and you can only see a short part of the name, so don't make it too long a name. Uh, then you can fill in your question and then you can type in your uh, answers, uh, depending on whether you want people to have a multiple choice or uh, a single choice. Uh, and you can have a list of 10 questions per poll, but you can have up to 25 polls for a meeting. Um, so that's quite a lot of polls. Um, you probably only want one or two, uh, but uh, between all of those options, that does it gives you quite a lot of uh, you know flexibility. So whilst you're in your meeting, uh, having turned the polls on, you now have a button that says polls, uh, and, and a couple of points to note about the polls is that actually when you launch a poll, that does not show in your recording. Uh, it, that's a bit annoying. Um, but the, the, you should be aware that the windows, whilst they show on screen for your attendees, they do not show as part of the recording. And also anybody that is host or a co-host is generally unable to vote uh, because basically they're the person launching or, or uh, running the poll. After the meeting, you can download a poll report from the report section. Um, that's very useful if you particularly want to know who said what or whatever. Uh, and again, it's most useful if you've used the registrations because you will have uh, names against the people. If you haven't used registration, it's a bit hit and miss as to whether people are logged in and whether you get uh, names against that. Uh, when it comes to uh, running the poll, so you've clicked on the polls and it brings up a launch poll window. Um, very simply, when you're ready to launch it, you click on the launch. But if you might, if you have more than one poll, you will see at the top, you've got a little drop down arrow. And from there, you can select which of the polls you want to launch. Once you launch the poll, notice that the top bar of the look poll window is now green and there is a time showing. So that's showing that the poll is live and it's showing that, the, that how long the poll has been live for. I would suggest about a minute is generally enough time for most people to uh, complete the poll. But again, if you have multiple questions, you might wanna give that a little bit more time uh, and just keep an eye on the sort of percentages of number of people have replied. Um, and, and then you can, when enough, you have sufficient responses, you then click on the end polling. 
Uh, so the end poll will then show you uh, what the results and you have an option again to share the results. So you click on the share results and that will bring up the final results uh, option there. Um, and again, notice that it does have the green bar against it to show uh, live. Uh, I would recommend um, before you exit the meeting, and it doesn't necessarily have to be done at the time of the poll, is just to take a screenshot of the poll just for your reference as well. Whilst you can get that information from the poll report, it's generally quite useful to have an immediate sort of uh, screenshot of it um, for your reference. Um, there is an option to do a very basic survey with Zoom uh, meetings. Um, you turn that on by your account settings. Um, and, and basically at the end of the meeting, it will give a thumbs up, thumbs down. And uh, if someone gives a thumbs down, there is an option to, to put a, a short message. Uh, if you are running a webinar, you can actually do a more comprehensive survey and have sort of set questions um, that you want specific answers to. Obviously, you could still use a third party survey company as well. Um, but from a meetings point of view, the survey option is very uh, basic. Um, and I think most of us could probably say the thumbs up, thumbs down is likely to be couldn't hear or something of that nature. Uh, so we'll now take our second pause for any additional questions on that section. OK, thanks very much, Wendy. And we've got a number of questions in the chat. Now, I'll start with Colin, Colin Ince. He wants to know why his image disappears and returns with movement in the background. Now, we've all seen this. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it'll do it with me as well if I move around uh, that. And, and if you look, you can see the back of my sofa through my headphones as well. Um, to be honest, I don't particularly know the real answer for that. I think it's to do with the fact that the computer is having to generate the background for you. If you actually had a proper uh, green screen cloth behind you, uh, then that is less likely to occur. It also can be affected by the color that you are wearing. Uh, green screens are generally uh, green uh, and sometimes blue. Uh, and sometimes you find that things don't, uh, just don't stay, stand out. I've also found if you've got two of you on with a virtual background, that doesn't really work uh, at all uh, either. I think it's too much uh, motion. Uh, I, I was on one meeting where we couldn't see the person's partner at all. She completely disappeared onto the, the virtual background um, uh, on that. Uh, and, and at Christmas time, we were using um, Rachel GBI, did some really nice Christmas backgrounds. Uh, and my husband was doing some Santa Zoom calls and something about the, his red Santa outfit on the red background and Santa kept disappearing. Um, and it was really unfortunate because if we'd have realized that ahead of time, I would have made a grotto, but you're setting up and you realize it's not working. Um, so there are a lot of sort of technical reasons as why it's, it's not uh, working uh, for you. No, thanks for that. Uh, as I said before, we've all seen that. Now, Cressida Dickens says, she has some trouble sometimes sharing a recording. She wants to know what's going wrong there. Um, are you sharing the recording after the fact? Or are, are you talking about sharing uh, within the media, uh, within the meeting? Um, I talked about the best way of sharing a, a video within the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, if you're sharing a recording after the meeting, um, there are a number of ways that you can do that. Uh, you can do that via the Zoom uh, web portal. Um, I, I tend to actually share all of, if, if I'm going to share something for general use, I would actually share it via YouTube. So I would personally, I would download the recording. I would trim it so that you get rid of the chat at the beginning and any chat at the end. Uh, and it's very important uh, to make sure that you stop the recording uh, before you have your debrief session at, at the end. Uh, and that you've made sure everyone has left the meeting before you do that, uh, because you don't want something to say something inadvertently that somebody else might take offence to. Um, so if it's a case of sharing it afterwards, I would look at how you're sharing it. Uh, are you sharing it via Zoom? And sometimes, because uh, it will send you an email that says your recording is available and send you a, a password to, to go with it. Uh, I've forwarded that on to people. Sometimes it doesn't like the passwords. Um, so again, I might go in and make the password uh, something 
uh, a little bit more uh, legible, something like you know D1260 um, uh, service admin or SNA meeting or something of that nature, uh, make the password a little bit more straightforward. No, thanks for that. I certainly have been sharing some of my recordings to Dropbox and that's and people can access that in any other way. It's yeah. whatever way you can find it there. So Roger yeah. Barrows asked yeah. the question. Oh, sorry. sorry, we we transfer is another one that I use quite regularly for that. Uh, you don't have to have an account for it. It doesn't take up space in your Dropbox. Uh, you just have to have a little bit of patience. If it's a big recording, it will take a little while to upload. You get the link and send the person the link. Uh, uh, we transfer is a, a very useful way of sharing on a one to one basis. Sorry. No, no, thanks for that. I'll go back to Roger Barr's question. This is really a Rotary question about uh, is Rotary receiving any discounts for club subscriptions with so many clubs now participating? I mean, I think there is a non-for-profit option, but if anybody else knows of anything else, then do put it into the chat. We would love to hear. I, I do think you can download things from the web, but do let us know. Put it in the chat and let us know about that. Uh, well, actually, if you go to the Rotary Global Awards, you'll get a 20% discount off Zoom. There you are. Um, awesome. <laughs> I'm not sure if that will carry on. To, I can't remember whether that applied when I renewed mine uh, recently, but you'll certainly get 20% off for your uh, initial year. Um, and that apparently applies regardless of whether you go on the annual or the monthly basis. Um, if you do the monthly, it will take the 20% off e each month, apparently, which... Um, I, I had assumed it wouldn't, uh, but to be honest, um, it's actually more economic to take the annual because it, it's obviously slightly cheaper. Yeah, well, that's a great, that's a great uh, help there. So Sean goes back to the breakout room and he asks, can you put someone from the waiting room into a breakout room to speak to them before they are added to the main session? No. <laughs> uh, oh. In actual fact, the breakout rooms is the next section that we'll be oh. uh, covering. So. Uh, but the short answer is no, they have to be in the meeting before you can put them into a breakout. Yes, and I mean, and Angela Houghton asks a very similar thing. Uh, how are people put into the breakout rooms? But if you're covering that in the next section, we'll come across that. Yes. So Phil Jones asks, I have a single paid license. Can I have others run the administration I set up and run meetings? Um, you can. It's um, there is a way that you can set up uh, a, an additional user. Um, uh, I, I haven't gone into it here because it's, it's not entirely straightforward. But you can have more than one user uh, on your account, but they do have to have a Zoom account, even if it's a free one. If then, for instance, that you cannot make uh, a meeting and you want that person to um, open it you would have to go into your account and make that person the principal user of the account. Um, so it was something I would, I would use with caution, shall we say. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, um, if, if you want more information, um, um, Irene can put me in, put us into touch and uh, I do have some slides somewhere about it, but uh, it's not part of this main session today. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Now, Kathy, Kathy Rivet asks, do you need to update the settings for each meeting or does it carry over to the next meeting? Uh, most of the settings should carry out, keep carrying over. So, you, you know, so things like if you set your, your Zoom toolbar to be static, that'll stay static until you make the change. Uh, you've probably noticed that if you've got your virtual background set, um, you go into your, in my case, my Pilates session and I've still got my virtual background set um, so that you need to sort of uh, take that out. Uh, uh, and those so yes generally they, they will carry on to the next until you take them off yes and that's what happened with that <coughs> lawyer with the cat image he just yes. place him. yeah I, I think that was the uh the daughter yeah. had been using it with that third party filter um um and hadn't taken it off uh, and he didn't know how to do it uh, in that case i think it's actually a change of camera rather than a change of virtual background yeah. um but yes so <laughs> Anyway, Peter Hartley, uh, he says, Wendy mentioned to go to the Zoom website to update the programme. He, he asks, isn't it easier to go to the initial Zoom screen 
click on your image above the cog wheel and one of the options is to check for updates what do we think about that yeah that's that works equally um um i i would just um yeah i, I personally tend to go to the zoom website because i always check uh -huh. um the release notes to know why it's being updated uh, and sometimes if it's a minor update i won't necessarily uh bother um it, it's a personal preference thing that's all yeah no that's fine and graham alden asks is there a means to edit a recording in zoom uh you can't edit the recording in zoom you you edit the recording after zoom uh -huh. um when the meeting is finished so uh I've just put a couple of uh, additional PDFs in the chat. Uh, one of them has uh, some links to some useful sort of bits and pieces. Um, so there are a couple of programs there that will allow you to edit your Zoom meeting. Uh, one of them, which is called Lossless Cut, that's quite useful if all you want to do is trim the meeting and that you can literally trim off the start of it so you trim off the chit chat while everyone's arriving and you trim off the, the goodbyes and you just end up with your essential pit uh, and that has the advantage that it doesn't you don't have to um uh reissue the file um on that so it's just cutting the original file um there's a, a program also there called open shot that i use it as, as again it's a free program uh which you can download and that has basic video editing functions you can get other video uh, editing programs. They tend to be quite complicated. So if you've never done it before, you might want to steer away from the complicated programs till you've got a good idea of what you're doing. Yeah, well, thanks for that. <coughs> so Excuse there's me. a couple of questions about auto cue. Derek asks, Derek Downey asks, how do you read a document on screen whilst giving a presentation without participants reading it? And Eve Conway asks, very similar, is there an auto cue function available for use of a script on an individual's presentation? Don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I good, have... good, uh, excellent question. Yes. Um, uh, I'm not aware of anything that you could use uh, uh, as an auto cue. Um, I wouldn't recommend reading off notes. Uh, you get an awful lot of sort of top of person's head um, there. Um, I would just say is position your notes so that they're also at eye line, so you're not obviously sort of looking uh, away. But it's it's a very good question. It's something that uh, might be worth looking into. Uh, I mean, I've certainly looked into it myself, and I think there are some options. There are some paid options, and I'm exploring them because, like you say, you want it to be seamless. So mm. I'll, I'm exploring myself, and I'm sure others are. So I'm sure we can get back to you on that one. And I think I'll just do another a couple of questions and then we'll go back to the main body. And again, it's a similar thing. Derek and Eve, I think they're a bit of a tag team here. <laughs> uh, can you take a photograph of all participants? And Eve asks, how do you take a screenshot on Zoom? Uh, well, yes, you, obviously you can take a photograph. Um, if you're going to be using uh, a photograph, you need uh, on any sort of social media, you need to make sure that the people you've taken the photograph of are aware that you're using them for that. Um, so you probably will have noticed that on some of the slides here that I have blurred out names and faces uh, and so on uh, to reserve, preserve people's sort of uh, privacy um, for that. If you're on a PC, you just literally hit print screen and that will take a screenshot of your whole screen. Uh, and actually, if what you want to do is take a screenshot of, say, of your whole gallery, that's a much better option than using your, your camera uh, anyway. Uh, with Windows, that automatically, uh, within your pictures folder, you will have a screenshots folder, so you will find it there. Um, but in that document that I've just uploaded with additional links, uh, it does talk about another sort of couple of options um, for taking sort of screenshots. Um, I use a third party program to take my screenshots because I that I've used to put this together because I only want to take little bits here and there rather than a whole screen each time. Mm -hmm. well, thanks for that. So I think we've got some more questions waiting and if there's more questions to come up, we'll get to them at the end of the session. So I'll just hand back to Wendy. I'll stop my video and let the presentation begin. All right, thank you. Um, right, so we've talked a little bit about uh, breakout rooms uh, earlier. So how do I create my break breakout rooms? 
Again, you need to have this setting turned on uh, within your uh, Zoom settings before you will get the breakout rooms uh, open. Uh, when you start the, the, your, your meeting, you will then have a breakout rooms button. Um, you should be aware that if you're using an older version of Zoom, only the host can set up and start a breakout room. Um, but from uh, version 5.4.7, uh, the co-host can now do that as well. But if you have multiple people doing it, I suggest uh, that you have just one person dedicated to sorting out your, your breakout rooms. Um, otherwise, uh, the other person could do something and they could override the setting that they've just uh, done for that. You can, as I've said, only assign somebody to a room once they're in a meeting. So not in the waiting room, they have to be properly in the, the meeting before you can assign them. And at the moment, breakout rooms are not available in uh, webinars. Uh, this is something that Zoom is talking about, uh, but they have been talking about it for a few months um, and nothing's happened as of yet. Uh, so if you want to use breakouts at the moment, you do have to be um, in meetings rather than webinar. There is a facility to uh, assign people into breakout rooms uh, in advance. Uh, and for that, you go to your uh, Zoom web portal, go to your meeting, and you have to edit the meeting uh, and tick the option uh, to uh, pre-assign. And then you can either sort of type in everyone's email address or probably a, not, a lot easier option is you can upload a very basic CSV file. Uh, and so if you choose the upload the CSV file, you'll get a window to browse uh, and then you can select the CSV, which basically just needs to be a list of uh, room names and people's email addresses. Uh, once that's imported, you can then view the different rooms that you've got sort of set up um, uh, and change people around if you need to. Um, and once you're actually in the meeting, you don't have to stick, stick with uh, those pre-assignments. You can re recreate all your rooms, uh, start again, um, which you might want to do if you want to do small groups to start off with. Uh, but then there is an option to recreate those rooms uh, and uh, you, you close the existing breakout rooms, uh, go to uh, the recreate and recover to the pre-assigned. And that will go back to uh, the setting that you had uh, originally imported in. So once you're in the meeting, your access is via the breakout rooms uh, on the, the toolbar. Uh, if you haven't already pre-assigned them, uh, it, your first option is uh, the create rooms option and you can decide how many rooms you want and you can decide how you want to assign uh, people to there. So there is an option to assign people automatically there is an option to assign people uh, manually and you have an option where participants can choose. So that might be an option you might want to use if it's more of a sort of social occasion uh, and you're just having a bit of a chit chat and you want to break into sort of smaller groups. Uh, and then you simply click on open when ready. But there's also a number of options that are really useful for your breakout rooms. Um, one of which is uh, automatically move people into the meetings. That's a good option to have ticked because sometimes people don't always tick the button uh, and, and are stuck in the main room uh, and don't quite know what to do. You can set a timer for them. So again, if you've got a set amount of time, you want 10 minutes to discuss this point, uh, you would set that, you would actually set that for nine minutes and then have your countdown for 60 seconds. So you, have, you can have the countdown as well. You also have an option to notify you when the meeting time is up. That will bring up a, a message to the host to say that the time is up, and then it gives you the option to, to let it close the, the meetings, or if you think they need a couple more minutes, you can leave the meetings open and, and close them uh, at your leisure. So as I said, the automatic option is by far the easiest uh, option. It just puts everybody in there. But that's not always the best route, um, as a few of you may have been on our multi-district pets recently. Um, we needed to have certain people in certain rooms. Uh, and it took us a little while to sort of get the, the hang of that. Uh, and in the end, we ended up assigning everybody uh, manually. But that enabled us to make sure that we had a facilitator in each of the rooms. And basically, you just click uh, against the room where it says assign. 
it will give you a list of the people that you have in attendance and you just tick next to the person's name um, and it will assign that person to the room. Um, if you uh, have specific groups you want people to put in, uh, obviously you can use do that via the manually assign, uh, but what you want to have is a reference list for your own use and you will want to put that in name order because as you can see, the names do come up uh, in alphabetical first name order. Uh, yes, the surnames would normally show. Uh, I've, had, I've uh, obviously cleared those out for privacy reasons. Um, and it just makes it a lot easier to find the people uh, on that. A host is not automatically assigned to a room, a host or a co-host if you're using the more modern version, uh, but a host can actually join the room, uh, join any of the room. Again, if you're on an older version, uh, the host would need to be in the main room if they have to, to admit any latecomers. Um, from uh, version 5.4.9, um, the host can now admit somebody if they're in a breakout room, which is quite a useful sort of thing. From an attendee's point of view, whilst they're in the room, if they need help, there is a, a button here that says ask for help. And that will come up with a little window at the uh, host's end saying, uh, sorry, so first of all, it will show that you can invite the person, uh, the host to help. Uh, and then you'll get the little message that says so-and-so has been uh, notified. The host then gets a message that said such and such person needs assistance uh, and the host can then join the room uh, of those requiring assistance. Uh, and also if you have set the timer, you will find that in the top right of the screen, you will have a countdown, um, which can be quite useful for the facilitators say, to make sure that they uh, know how much time left that they've got. Uh, and you will always get a little pop up when the count up, countdown starts saying you have 30 seconds or 60 seconds, whatever you've set before this meeting closes. Um, and the person can use the leave room button to uh, leave the room, uh, depending on whether the set, what settings have been set within the rooms, they will either leave the room and uh, come back to the main room, or it may be that they actually end up leaving the meeting completely. So a couple of points to note regarding the breakout rooms. So with regard to the recording, um, th this is not part of the main recording. Somebody within the breakout room has to click the record button and it will get recorded locally. It's not recorded to the cloud. So you have to have the setting to allow lo local recording on to enable this. Any screen share that you might have been doing from the main Zoom area, does not come through to the breakout room. So again, a person within the meeting has to share the screen if they wish to carry on. And as mentioned earlier, the chat is not included in the main chat file. Uh, neither is the, the whiteboards. So both of these have to be saved before you exit the room if you wish to keep a record of it. Um, we've had a few questions about uh, closed uh, captions or live transcript. Uh, sometimes you'll see the CC for closed captions, sometimes you'll see uh, live captions uh, options uh, for that. Um, again, it's a setting uh, within Zoom, you have to turn this facility on, but then you also have to open up an account uh, with a third party. Uh, and the, the one that I was recommended to is uh, one called Otter.ai. Otter and I'm just adding into the, the chat um, the PDF that I was sent about this. Uh, once you've actually got that account with the, the, the company, um, then within the meeting, you turn on the live transcript to activate that. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, that it is uh, scheduled to be an integrated function within Zoom, but that's not going to be for another sort of six months or so. Um, for the attendee, they then should see, uh, a, they, they will have a button on their toolbar that says live transcript or CC, and they can use this to turn the captions on or off. Uh, while I've been testing it, I found that with some people, the captions come on automatically and you have to turn them off. And with other people, they don't and you have to turn them uh, on. Uh, the captions appear across the bottom of the screen. 
Um, but there are also uh, options within the uh, accessibility of the in Zoom meeting uh, options, uh, which will allow you to make the captions bigger. So again, if you're having to use the captions and you have a site issue, you might want to make your captions as large as it will possibly go to uh, make it easier for you to, to read. I've mentioned reports a few times. Um, reports are really useful uh, tool for you both before and after the meeting. If you go into the account management section, uh, you'll be able to access your reports um, from there. You can access for the meeting, you can access your uh, registration and your poll reports. Um, if you actually want your meeting attendance report, um, that's a little bit more obscure. I, don't ask me why, I don't know. You actually have to go into uh, the active host section, uh, then use the search bar to select a period. It will come up with a list of the meetings. Uh, if you can see, sorry, yeah, you should now be able to see um, that the number of participants is a blue link. If you click on the blue link, it will then bring up uh, another window which will show you who your meeting participants uh, were, uh, the times of joining uh, and exiting, how long they were on for. Uh, and there is an option to export that for a CSV. And you will find with a meeting that you will get two times uh, and that will effectively be the time the person was in the meeting and the, sorry, in the waiting room to initially and then the time that they're actually in the meeting. Uh, if you've used breakout rooms, you will get even more times uh, because that will show them uh, exiting the main meeting, coming back in. So you could end up with a report which actually has six or seven different activities per person. Uh, and equally, if the person has a dodgy connection, that will show us multiple uh, ins and outs. But from those reports, you can use those uh, to analyze your, your meeting uh, and have a look at maybe how effective you've been. Um, it does require fairly decent Excel skills, some of this. Uh, but if you look at the registrations by date, you can see that there are several peaks. And I know that those peaks are the dates that I've sent out the uh, emails advertising uh, the session. Uh, you can see the number of attendees uh, in the session. You can see it dropped off towards the end. And that quite often happens when you get to the last Q&A. And you can see the sort of graph showing how long people were in session. And on this particular one, you can see someone dropped out just before eight. So they probably had another meeting. Someone came in just after eight and equally they were coming in from something there. I get asked a lot about uh, connection issues. Um, um, really, this is an, an awful lot to do uh, with your own personal setup uh, and how you are connected to your router. You will also sometimes see signal strength uh, indicators uh, next to a person. Uh, and if it goes uh, yellow or God forbid red, then that means that they have got a very poor connection. Uh, and that is not good if that is your person is your principal uh, presenter. Um, if you are zooming a lot, I would recommend that you directly connect your device, your uh, PC or whatever to your router. You will get a better connection uh, that way. Uh, I have a very 20 meter long cable that connects me to my router, uh, which is upstairs, uh, which gives me a much better connection. If I have to use Wi-Fi down here, it's very poor. Um, if you are getting a dodgy connection, uh, turn your camera off. The camera uses a lot of bandwidth, so turn the camera off. Um, also, closing other programs uh, on your computer is always a good idea anyway. Uh, and if you have other people using Wi-Fi, if you're on a Wi-Fi connection, uh, do ask them perhaps not to download the latest film at the same time that you're on Zoom. Uh, that will actually strangle your, your Wi-Fi and reduce your connection speed. Uh, and if it's really bad, then think about actually switching your call to phone audio uh, so you can still take a part. Um, We've heard a lot about Zoom fatigue recently. Uh, there's a very interesting blog uh, that Zoom have just released uh, about it with a few sort of tips. Um, so if you are getting a bit fatigued, you can maybe hide your camera uh, so, so you're not looking at it, minimize the Zoom perhaps so it's not filling the screen. So there are a couple of useful sort of selection uh, sections there. Quite an important area is, is, is security. So, 
the one thing we want to do is, is to keep uh, all of our other Rotarians secure. So a principal point would be keep your Zoom up to date. Some Rotarians have not updated since we started using it last March. There are a lot of security updates that have got, gone on in the background uh, that you and I would not even notice that are, are there. Um, but we really want to make sure that uh, you, you keep your Zoom up to date and you're taking advantage uh, of those things. As I've said earlier, try not to use your personal meeting ID for sort of larger meetings or events, uh, which I have seen happened, um, because the meet personal meetings do not have uh, unique meeting IDs and passcodes. So anyone could come in at any point to your personal meeting, whether you want them to not, if they've got that link. Don't publish a direct link, as we've said, um, but a registration link is a much better option for that. Um, limit who can use the share screen. Um, and you might also want to limit some of the other options. And you'll have noticed that you'll have a little green shield in the top uh, right corner of your computer. Uh, that means that the end-to-end -end, uh, encryption is uh, secure. Uh, but occasionally you might notice it's got, gone to amber. And the reason for that is, is generally that you may have somebody who's come into the meeting on phone uh, and therefore that they cannot guarantee that the encryption is, is working. And there are also options within your own uh, account settings where you can turn on uh, audio and video uh, watermarks because there are other ways people can record uh, what they're seeing. Uh, but if you've got those watermarks engaged, you've got a much better way of trying to track down who the culprit is who shared something that you didn't necessarily want them to share to, uh, to end everyone. So that there are security options that you can set uh, within your account settings. Um, generally, we would probably have most of these uh, settings on, uh, but you can also uh, change those settings within a meeting. Uh, so things like turning the chat on and off. So if you've got an unruly participant, someone who's saying something vulgar, you might want to turn the chat off. Someone's named themselves basically something not very nice. You can actually turn off the option uh, to rename themselves uh, as well. Uh, you can mute all of your um, participants uh, as well. I think that should be coming off. Yeah. Um, yes, so as I say, you, you do have the option to remove participants uh, at any point in time. So again, use that shortcut to, that we, we referred to earlier, either right click on the camera or a hover over the name or the green uh, blue dots. We'll bring up the shortcut menu. You've got the option to remove somebody. You've also got the option to report somebody. Um, so you might want to report somebody and that will report that uh, person to Zoom. Um, uh, uh, and that will then get followed up by then. You've got the option to lock the meeting as well. Um, you just want to be aware if you do lock the meeting uh, is that somebody who may have a dodgy connection is not then gonna be able to come back into the meeting. Um, so I'm conscious we're up on the time. Uh, just a, a quick uh, couple of slides about um, meetings versus webinars. Um, if you have a large number of people basically the, the webinars allows you a lot more control over things. Uh, there are a couple of slides, but I'm not going to sort of go belabor those. Um, uh, you can read those on the notes that you'll be sent. Um, so thank you everyone for coming along. I hope you've all found that uh, uh, useful. Um, and if there are any further questions, um, albeit we are up on time, um, Irene, I'll, I'll hand that to you. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. So much information there and just so much to take in. So much we didn't know. Um, I've got a few questions left. Now, it's interesting. A lot of people were not able to download the links and I have put in the chat that actually it's an older version and if they update it, you'll get them. But we are sending out those links later along with the PDF version of your slides so they'll all get a copy of them. But really, back to what Wendy said earlier, update your Zoom, just get it all updated and you'll get all this stuff. Now, Roger, a couple of questions, if I, if I may, just indulge. Uh, Roger Glue asked the question, using breakout rooms, if you do not require registration through Zoom, you cannot pre-assign those who join without registration. You cannot have more than 200 people in breakout rooms in total. It's just a, a comment there. 
yeah, that, that is correct. But to be honest, if you're not using registration, I'm not sure why you would want to pre-assign 200 people uh, and having to manually sort of uh, put, put those uh, in. Yeah. Um, uh, if, if you are using registration, uh, my recommendation would be to download your registration report and create your pre-assigned list based off that registration report uh, and pre-assign them uh, that way. Yeah. Uh, and William Wilhelm uh, Peterson, he's tried to download the link to Zoom, uh, but quite unsuccessfully. What's going wrong there for him? Uh, he, he should just be able to, you just go to, I mean, if the link didn't work, if you go to uh, zoom.us, the main Zoom web page, literally scroll to the bottom of the page. Uh, at the bottom of the page, there's a, a little section that says downloads. Uh, and you'll want the Zoom for clients is use, is the option for um, PCs, laptops, Macs, yeah. Yeah, so Robert's got another question. He's run a, a Zoom Pro meeting recently and allowed co-host to present his talk. His camera view disappeared and couldn't get it back. Any reason for that? The only reason I'm aware of that is uh, if they were using a tablet. Oh. If you're sharing a screen on a tablet or, or a phone, your camera will disappear. Uh -huh. um, but other than that, your camera should only disappear if you actually uh, turn it off. Uh -huh. uh, or if, for instance, if you've got somebody else spotlighted, then you wouldn't necessarily see um, the other cameras. Yeah. So I suppose what, we've got some more questions, but I think we'll just answer one more question. And for those other questions, we will send out, we'll answer them and get them out to you. But Sue's got a question and it's about breakout rooms. This is always a, a question that comes up. If breakout rooms have been pre-assigned via the web browser, we found that a co-host couldn't manage those preset breakout rooms in the meeting. Has that changed with more recent versions? Uh, I believe so, yeah, because originally the co-host couldn't do um, anything within the breakout room. So it is the more recent version that you need to have that will allow the co-host to make those changes. Uh, and in fact, I know it does work because um, uh, going back to the uh, MD pets, um, Phil had originally set those up, uh, but he made me co-host and then I was able to take control uh, and set up all the, the rooms on that occasion. Well, I think we are just slightly over time. So I think we will need to just wrap up now and it just, it's just for me to say thank you so much, Wendy, for this. And thank you to the participants as well for making it such an engaging morning. So enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope you join us again soon for Masterclass. But if you want to watch it again or you want to give that out to your clubs, it will be available on the Rotary Northwest of England. It will be on our um, our own site. Uh, so we'll have a look for that. That would be great. So once again, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.